I think it was his jaws kind of crushing my legs. Instantly, I knew it was a whale. I'm getting shivers right now. So what would you say to all those people around the world who might doubt your story then? I, I don't know. Are we ready? Yeah. Yep, ready. Yep. All right, here we go. Yeah, I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online body language course, uh, Body Language Tactics, with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, and gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes. I did 20 years in the U.S. military. I'm an expert in human behavior, interrogation, behavior profiling, and influence. And I've written a few books on the same, a couple of bestsellers, and now I train the general public in those topics. Greg. Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written 10 books on body language and behavior. Put together this body language tactics at bodylanguagetactics.com course with Scott. And I spend most of my time on Wall Street and corporate America. All right, well, today we're going to talk about, and I, I'm sure everybody's heard about the guy who says he's been swallowed by a whale and then lived to tell his story. So that's, what, what we, that's who we're going to talk about today. Greg found the video, and vi Greg, tell us about what, we, what we're going to be looking at. Yeah, so we have two videos. Number one, we're going to see him tell his story about being swallowed by a whale. And it's Australian in 60 Minutes, they're asking questions. We get pretty good video and lots of Lots of him telling you the story. Now, the better part of this is he also was in a plane crash in Costa Rica in 2001, which is verified. And we get to hear him tell his story about the Costa Rican plane crash. And you get to see what baseline really is. And then we'll look at him. Yeah. All right. Well, if you like what we're doing, please subscribe and hit the like button. And uh, let's move along to the first video. The next thing that I remember is that I woke up on my back looking up at the sky and the trees and I thought to myself, oh my God, I was just in a plane crash and I'm alive. I remember just thinking about where I was, about where the plane was. <laughs> Because I didn't see anything around me except for trees. I'm just happy there was somebody else to go through that with. Because I knew it was going to be tough. I started thinking, oh my God, I'm going to make it out of here. And I was amazed by him trying to console me, even through all his pain. My chest and was just in so much pain, I couldn't breathe. I knew it was gonna be a, probably the longest night of my life, and I wasn't looking forward to it. They wouldn't let me sleep, and kept yelling to me. Michael, are you there? You awake? Michael, Michael, all night long. And I was getting almost mad. Just leave me alone, just let me sleep. I was incapable of taking care of myself, and Alvaro was also incapable of taking care of himself. It was miserable. I could only last so long in this condition. I just started crying, and it was the most emotional period. Uh, I couldn't, couldn't believe it. Well, let's go around the room, and let's talk about what we saw in his baseline, and then we'll move on to the uh, story about the whale. So, Mark, you want to go first? Yeah, okay. Uh, so a couple of phrases there that we'll hear later on in the other videos. Uh, oh, my God, and I'm alive. So those get repeated in the other story. So we can either take that as a, as a baseline and we can listen out for, for that, or we can also go, well, well, these calling up a God is a phrase that he uses when something has actually happened. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. Um, we saw there what um, what uh, some of his emotions look like, what uh, that kind of 
desperation or, or complete loss, that idea of being completely trapped, uh, no way out. We got a sense of what that looks like. We saw uh, Chimbos movement there. We saw where the eyes go to. So let's look out for that later on. As a generality, what I'm hearing is is a lot of downward intonation, um, a lot of fry in the voice. So under-energized, downward intonation, um, almost what I would say is a depressive tone. So again, let's look out for whether we get that type of tonality in this other story that we get, which is similar in that it's a life, it's a, it's a brush with death shall we say, you know, so here we've got a baseline for a brush with death that is verified to, uh, to have happened, it's been corroborated, it's, it's factual in that there are more than three other people who can kind of go, yeah, we have evidence that, that, it, that it happened. And, um, and then we've got another brush with death story, which is less verifiable, no photographic uh, evidence. There is another uh, person who said they saw some of the uh, aftermath of it, but they weren't at the actual uh, event. So there, there's a, a quick overview for you on that one. Greg, uh, what do you got? Yeah, so what we know is he's telling the truth. He's a bit of a storyteller. He's a little bit of a punctuator with, you know, all the chin boss and all that. That's real emotion typically when somebody does a chin boss. And Chase, you'll cover that in detail, I'm sure. He punctuates with his brows when he's talking. When he's making eye contact, he raises his brow a bit to punctuate. That's not the same as, hey, you believe me, don't you? And you don't see a whole lot of, hey, you believe me, don't you, in this story. He's telling the story. He's halting. It's his style. His blink rate is higher than a normal person's blink rate, but this is normal for him, whatever it is. Now, that could also be because, you know, he's feeling emotion. He's wanting to tell the story and he's wanting to put as much of him into it as he possibly can. I think he likes to tell stories. And I think this is a big one. I mean, this doesn't happen to everybody in their life to survive a plane crash. And he was injured pretty badly. Um, when he does, my chest was in so much pain, I couldn't breathe. He illustrates with his left hand and his eyes access to the left. He does his brows up a little bit when he's, um, when he's asking you to to understand what he's saying. And that's about it. I won't go any further than that, but he punctuates his emotion. He's moving his hands, he's moving his face, and he's telling a story. Uh, Chase, what do you got? I agree with you guys. And what we see here is him being still. There's not a lot of body animation or body narration. He's not selling the story with his body. He's making solid eye contact with the interviewer. There is a lack of eye flutter. So when he blinks, he blinks. It's not a, a consistent flutter here. The chin boss and the tears is indicative of grief. Some kind of, a, even if we're recalling grief, our faces are likely to do that. There's even a really cool study in, in New York that New Yorkers rarely speak to each other, especially strangers. Uh, it's a lot like Sweden. But after 9-11 happened, these body language experts noticed that New Yorkers were exchanging tight-lipped expressions towards each other, which we would typically look at as withheld opinions. And later on in a, in a recent body language research, this tight-lipped uh, exchange between people, also involving this little chin boss muscle here, was uh, also given a second name as a shared grief expression. I think that's pretty interesting, just as a quick uh, tidbit there. He's saying, I remember, there's not a lot of use of and then. There's not a, an overuse of the word and here. I want you to pay attention to that in the videos coming up. He's not using and then, there's not a lot of and. And even when he's looking away for recall, you know, he's looking away to process a piece of the story. In the middle of that, he's still checking back in with the interviewer. There's still little check-ins in between this. He's a social person. He's a good storyteller. So he's recalling all this data and pulling the person back in with eye contact. He knows exactly how to do this. Very socially intelligent guy. So that's what we're seeing here in a provable, truthful video. Uh, Scott. All right. All right. Now, I agree with all you guys. And we're seeing no illustrators. We don't see any hand movement. We don't see a very, very not very variating from this gaze he's got with it when he's telling the story. He's a, it's a fixed gaze he's telling. 
However, his eye flutter does happen in some spots where it gets where he where he talks about some things that happened that were that were scary, or he, when he talks about pain, he gets those going. And it's I, and throughout that, it's al- it's almost common. So I, I'm gonna as we go forward, I'm gonna look at that as something that's normal for his baseline in most every situation. Um, so I say he's got a fixed gaze. He's very calm, and and there's not there's not a whole lot of animation whatsoever in this. And he's talking very low. We're talking about two completely different situations here. We're talking about somebody got killed in the first one. In the second one, he's he's not even talking to a person. He's talking to a camera uh, over the internet. Whether there's somebody sitting there he's talking to or not, I thought about that. I thought, well, maybe there's the person sitting there. Well, pretend you're talking to him as you're talking to me. Maybe that's what's happening. I don't know. But, but because it looked like a person, but I'm under the impression he's talking to a computer. And so we're looking at two completely different situations there for the guy asking questions and with him answering the questions going back and forth. So big difference in his, in his baseline and what we're getting ready to see, I believe. And we'll look at this the video we just saw again at the very end. So you can, again, uh, make that comparison and for yourself and see what's happening there. All right. You guys ready to look at the first video? Yeah. yeah. Great point uh-huh. from that uh, yep. distance. Oh, thanks. Well and I was on my third dive and almost got to the bottom and I just got hit by just a freight train out of nowhere. Just got blown. And then everything went dark. And I'm moving through the water. And I'm like, what the? What? Where am I? What happened? Did I get eaten by a shark? No, I can't feel any cuts. I, 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 I don't think it's a shark. And then instantly I knew it was a whale. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so his blink rate is higher than it was in the other, and there's more flutter. Chase, I agree with you. There's a lot more flutter than there was in the first one. We know that his blink rate high is fairly normal, but this is even more exaggerated. And then everything went down. And then. I always went, when I hear and then, doesn't mean he's lying. Just means there's some time missing in there. And there's nobody there to see it. As you said, Mark, there's somebody on the boat, but there's nobody there to actually see this. He has exaggerated movement and his eyes break down into his left. When he was recalling about the plane crash, his eyes were here. Now, there's lots of reasons your eyes could drop down left. How does a person perceive what you're saying and those kinds of things? There's a slight smile going on in his mouth as well as he's telling this story. And then he does that pulling taffy eye movement. You're with me, right? You're with me. You're with me, trying to make sure you're still following. Tongue juts out, and then he does, right after he tells the story, his lips go tight right after the tongue jut, and his forehead goes up in request for approval and holes and clamps. This feels like the fish might, something may have happened with the whale, but this might be a big fish story. That's where I'll leave that. Um, Scott, what do you got? All right. Um, You don't tell traumatic stories, horror stories that are adrenaline filled like this. You don't remember that many details. This guy gets way too detailed on what happened. When something big happens and you get that shot of adrenaline and you're fighting for your life, you don't think about anything else about except fighting for your life. You don't, we're going to see him go through this process of making decisions and, and planning things out all while he's in the, in the mouth of this supposedly of a whale. This, you don't tell stories that way. That's not the way this happens. I'm going to focus more on the way he, he presents the story than on body language mostly in this. So that's the road I'm going to be going down. He's not, you're not supposed to be thinking about the little things, just says your brain and your limbic system as these things happen. He does this tongue thing, but I think the tongue thing isn't because he's sorry he's saying that or afraid or something. He's, he's fighting for time there. He's look, he's doing these things because his brain is still making up parts of the story. Some of the things we're going to hear, I've heard, I heard him tell this, this, a similar story about this in another interview. And it's not the same as this, as this one. He's, he adds a couple of things. We'll get to that in a little while. Um, when he say, when he, when he's in the shark, or in the in the uh, whale, he's he's saying out loud to or say, who's he talking to, and he's saying, "I don't feel any cuts. I don't feel any pain. It's not a shark. Nobody does that. Nobody does that. Nobody. You would just be freaking out, going, I got to get out of this thing, and you might dawn on you that it's a whale. So it must be a whale. And then he talks about the his legs getting crushed. I think that's what's happening in this one. Um, we'll get to that in a second. Um, 
Because what you're saying is you wouldn't be saying, oh, I wonder if this is, a, you know, is this a shark? You're going to be yelling, oh, no, oh, God, please, no, no, oh, God, please, please, no, God, please. You're going to be talking to God at that point, whether you believe in God or not. That's who you're going to be. That's who you're going to be having a conversation with. So right at, right at the beginning from this thing, it sounds like it, it sounds just like a bunch of too many, too many. Um, too much verbal bridging. He says just three times in this. And we're going to see the word and used. And then this happened. And then, and then he says, and all of a sudden, a, a lot too. So I just, just right out of the gate, this sounds like it's not true to me. But I, I guess I shouldn't say that part now. Anyway, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I, I agree with you guys. And let's talk about I access and cues really briefly. They're not definitive. They're very reliable and they're even more reliable the more times you're able to establish a pattern. I first learned this and was using it in a social capacity in an interview. And I asked somebody about their backyard of their home. And I said, I want you to describe the backyard of that home. It was the home they grew up in as a 19 year old person. And I was expecting to see some visual recall, which in the eye accessing Bible, whatever that is, is moving upward because we're accessing the occipital lobe, which is in the back of our head. But I see emotional stuff going on. I see downward movement in the eyes. And then later on after the interview, I asked, well, like, what was it? What were you thinking of in the backyard? And he said, oh, the first thing I thought of is how my dad passed away a month ago. He and I used to play baseball back there. We used to play and throw the ball back and forth. And that was that was the first thing I thought of. So we can't always rely on it, but we can rely on patterns. So we're, what we're looking for here are patterns of eye movement. And uh, to Scott's point, uh, when you were talking about him using and, I counted. It's okay. using oh, okay. and, which is an average of every 4.2 seconds in this clip. And he says, and then twice, which is a, a time bridge or, or hiding time uh, indicator. And when he says, I instantly knew it, it was a whale. There's a shake of the head. There's lip licking, a shoulder shrug, followed by lip compression. Those are all indicators or things that suggest uh, that there's some deception going on. The rapid eye blink here, I want you to look for this. When he's saying the word impact, it was up to 91 blinks per minute. And please keep in mind, the average is around 16, give or take. And he shifts from past tense to discussing a story in past tense to present tense two times in this one clip. He's going past to present, which is very indicative of a story that is either fabricated or added on to. We can, we can see both of those in both situations. Mark? Yeah, so um, so I think just to fill in some of the ideas around what his setup is, as 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 Scott was hinting to there, uh, I think seeing the lighting, I think there are other people there because somebody else has had to set up that cam, a, a really good camera and some really good lighting. So I'm just going to suppose that there is a a crew there with him, and he probably does have somebody off camera who's feeding him the questions. The interviewer isn't there, my understanding would be they're not there at the time and and they've connected them later on via the idea of, of watching a live computer feed. I don't think it's live uh, at all. I think because of that, we get some uncertainty at one point about where this interviewee is meant to be looking. We get them slightly looking at the camera, slightly going past the camera. I would put one of the tongue elements there to him being unsure at that point where to look and probably realizing eh, just look down the camera shouldn't have done that i think there's just a little bit of uncertainty at the at the start here non-verbally which i'm i'm not going to put to him being deceitful or making up a story here now let's actually look at the uh, oh by the way yes um a baseline uh this is way more excited than the first story, way more energetic, way more excited um, than, than the first brush with death. Now, uh, this is one of the classic stories, the belly of the whale, the eaten bit by the big fish. This goes right back to Jonah and the whale. Pinocchio, masterpiece of animation, uh, has the father in the belly of a whale. Uh, the idea of being eaten by an animal and being pulled out 
especially by your son, uh, is, is a classic example of a rebirth story. It's an archetype. Essentially, what we're going to see that here is how he tells this archetypal story. Um, and, and the reason I want to tell you this is that it's going to be incredibly seductive. Elements of this archetypal story are told really well. Elements aren't told that well, and they don't really play out as they could. And that can help lead us to an understanding of how true might this story be? Because there are some resonant themes that come up in this that you'd see in every belly of a whale story, uh, just as you'd see them in every I Got Abducted by Aliens story. If you, if you, even if you'd never heard one of those stories before, there's some certain themes that are kind of come out. You're going to get darkness. You're going to get depth. You're going to get an abyss. You're going to get light. You're going to get air. You're going to get the sky. You're going to be hot, held tight by something. Uh, your, your clothes are going to disappear or you're going to have lose your hair. You're going to lose something. You're going to come back in the end and you're going to come back different. That's what we call the journey and return. So I want to look at how well he follows that story. Let's go into this first part here. It was the third dive. Now, this is a brilliant start to a story because he instantly tells us he's been down twice already. He's diving for lobsters. Lobsters are precious. This is his third time going down into the abyss for something precious. It would be a bit boring. It's like first time down. Fifth, I've been down seven times. I've been down 12. Three is really nice because you get it once, you get it again, and then you get a pattern interrupt. And then bang, it comes out of nowhere. That is a classic of the whale story. It hits you out of nowhere. You never expect going into the abyss. You're never ready for it. So um, so he gets hit uh, really quick. Oh, by the way, he got hit almost at the bottom. So he's almost at, at rock bottom. Surely he couldn't get any deeper. Well, he gets hit by a freight train. Odd metaphor to use for the the, the whale. Anyway, I, I'll, I'll, I'll discount that. But it comes out of nowhere and there's and now everything is in complete darkness and he's totally disorientated that's brilliant storytelling and so because he's taken us from the journey to something golden and precious of the lobster to now he's completely trapped and disorientated and in darkness and he's done that really quickly and the only reason i want to tell you that is that's very compelling <laughs> whether it's whether it's true or false it's incredibly compelling, and so we need to watch ourselves, because maybe it's true, maybe it's false, let's see what happens. But our bias uh, is going to be, I would say, towards wanting to believe this, because it's such a beautiful idea, as I'll hopefully flesh out for you. Uh, beautiful archetypal storytelling there. There, that's all I got for you. And I was on my third dive and almost got to the bottom and I just got hit by just a freight train out of nowhere. Just got boom. And then everything went dark. And I'm moving through the water. And I'm like, what the? What? Where am I? What happened? Did I get eaten by a shark? No, I can't feel any cuts. I, I, I don't think it's a shark. And then instantly I knew it was a whale. Excellent. We good? Yeah, we're good. Let's move along. Took me about five seconds to realize I was in that whale's mouth and and I went, holy sh I'm traveling through the water like fast. He, he's like cruising through the water and water's just pouring in through his mouth. And as soon as it happened, my regulator came out of my mouth and thank God the regulator didn't fall behind my back. It was like kind of pressed up between his mouth and me because it was kind of tight in there and I just saw my regulator there and I put it back in my mouth and went, okay, I got air, but I'm still in here. All right, I'm gonna go first on this one because I know what everybody's wanting to do. <laughs> Let's talk about his regulator. He says he saw his regular. First thing he said was it was dark. Everything went dark after this train hit him. How is he going to see his regulator there? He looked down and see it out of all that. We should stop here. That this this just says no. That that didn't happen. Uh, it's this and this part is one of the things that's new. In the other interview, he didn't mention this at all. 
didn't mention it at all. It would make sense something like that would happen. So your mask would come off too. Didn't say anything about that. Um, he doesn't talk about holding his breath at all when any of that happened. Then say I had to hold my breath because my regulator came off. That'd be one of the first things you said. When you breathe, that's life. That's the first thing you do. Chase, what do you do when you come up on somebody that's been hit by a car or they're just laying there? You make sure what? That's, uh, that's the big thing you check. Yeah, that's make sure ABCs. it's a clear airway. Yeah, man, make sure they can breathe. That's the very first thing you do. And if they're not breathing, you get that thing. So when that happens to you, you're going to get that taken care of pretty quick, and you're going to talk about it. Um, let's see. There's so much here. I won't do everything. Now, then when he says, okay, I got my air, and then he does this big relaxation thing, like everything's going to be okay now, but I'm still in here. Come on, man. I just, I, I can't, I just can't get past that. These, this sounds like it's in sections of his story because they're not emotionally tied together with anything, with, with an emotion as he goes through this. He's just telling this thing in sections as he's made them up, as he tries to, re, as he's trying to think of what it would actually be like in a whale's mouth. So there's that. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so when we talk about eye movement, now, Chase, I'll go back to exactly what you just said. There's a study, and, and you brought it up before, Scott, called The Eyes Don't Have It. And what that study said was the eyes used on NLP, if you look to the right, didn't mean you were lying. People tried to prove that if you looked a certain way, it meant you are lying. Never said that they're not eye movement patterns that are discernible that you can find for an individual person. This guy, we know that he's been doing this when he was recalling details of the jungle thing. However, now when he starts to tell stories, he drops down into his left. That's a different place. I won't go into why or that. Let's just say there's a baseline deviation. That's one. Let, let me say one thing, Greg. Let me yeah. say one thing about what you said once about about the NLPI stuff. Yeah. You yeah. said they were headed down. They thought they'd tripped up on something or heading down the right road, but didn't do the correct research on it. And just sort of stopped there and said, ah, oh, this is the way this works. I agree with you on that. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you, anecdote is not science. Everybody will tell you that. But if you see a million people do the same thing, that means something. And if you watch people and you know that you can ask the right question, find eye accessing. To Chase's point, what he happened to do was to tap into a second sensory channel. He's hitting emotion. If you can isolate something someone heard that has no emotional content, you'll get a place. If you isolate a visual cue that has no emotional content, you'll get a, a certain cue. The minute you start tapping into emotional things, you're going to get a different place. And that's where they missed is you got to get to each individual and people do all kinds of weird stuff. We're not going to say where he's going in his head. He does look down to his left as he's trying to tell this guy something and raises his brow for approval that we didn't see in the other story, which is kind of interesting. I also watched the tongue jut just as he goes to down left. There's a tongue jut a down left look as he's talking in a brow rise. Now, people lie in lots of ways. And one of those ways is embellishment. The fish wasn't this big, it was that big. So did something happen? Don't know. Is he embellishing? Probably. That's just my guess. And even if you're telling a story that is true, you go back and you add lots of details. So you go back and say, well, this happened and that happened and I had my respirator and you just keep adding details because never let facts get in the way of a great story. You keep adding details to make your story better. Lots of people do that. The interesting piece for me, and I teach this always when I'm telling somebody, when somebody tells you the fish was this big, they're illustrating out of frame. That's usually a red flag for me. Notice he's illustrating out of frame over here, entirely out of frame. He's talking over here. Then he looks at him, looks up, smiles, and eye locks. He's got a lot of details here that have no, no value to the story, what I would call too much information. So he puts me suspicious that he's embellishing something, maybe he had a run-in of some kind, but there's too much detail. There's too much eye contact that's prolonged, and there's a lot of change in his baseline. So that's what I got. Um, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So again, archetypally, the pattern it's following now is the idea that the person in the in the belly of the whale who's been eaten by the beast will now be disrobed, disrobed of of their former profession. And so if you go back and you and you read a whole bunch of getting eaten by a big animal, whether it's a, a ending up in the stomach of a bear or or whales are better because you can kind of hang out in Pinocchio, you know, Pinocchio's father hangs out there for a good long time. And 
and, and some of the really old stories, uh, you, you get the idea that the, the person had their flesh eaten away and they lost their hair and all kinds of stuff. And they still came up a month a month later. Well, he, he's not going to get away with that kind of level of, of story that you could get away with within the 18th century. But you can get 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 past the idea of I lost the, the thing that gives me life. I lost the part of my clothing that gives me gives me life and and tells you my persona, who I am. I'm a diver. And so what classically happens in these stories is there's a journey from who the person was, usually their persona, what they're seen as by the outside world as the work that they do and who they really are internally you know what their what their kind of spirit is what they what they would be without all of that outer casing and so that i think is what we see in that part of the story is because scott's right like it's dark how would you you can't see anything you could feel around uh for for stuff maybe that would make more sense but to see it yeah it doesn't it doesn't you know come quite true around that so i think this is an archetypal moment of being kind of deep defrocked uh, a little bit now the story could be a little bit better because he says you know within five seconds he's got the really far moving really fast bit that's the kind of journey th through another universe but he's still got time and you'll find in other archetypal stories time gets lost have you seen that in uh, in alien uh, alien abdu abduction stories suddenly Time is very, very fluid. We moved really fast. I got transported. Time became really fluid. I don't know anything about the time. He kind of lacks that for a really good archetypal story. I, I love his his big acting out of this. And again, it's really good entertainment. And I do want you to watch throughout this, the interviewer, because the interviewer is really showing us how we should respond to this. It's a delightful story to that interviewer, an incredible story for that interviewer as a, as a brush with death. Not, not, not one full of well, I mean, horror, really, because as we find out later, he's he says he's going to die. He's given up. It's like, that's it for me. I'm I'm done. But what we're meant to be doing through as, as the interviewer is performing for us, we're meant to be delighted and, and excited by this brush with uh, complete demise, which again, again, is an odd attitude, I think, around all of this. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there on that one. Uh, Chase, what do you got around this? Yeah, great stuff, uh, everybody. Uh, I'll, I'll go back to a couple of things I said. He shifts to the present moment when he says, I'm traveling through the water. So we start off in the present tense. Not a good sign. Then there's some lip licking that goes on here. And we typically associate lip licking if it's out of baseline, which I think it is here, as a hygienic gesture. It's designed to improve someone's social appearance or make them more believable or make their story more believable. If I saw this video out of context, this fluid body narration where he's telling the story and showing how big everything was, and pushing through the water, he's selling it with his movements. He's showing you things. He's grabbing the regulator, putting it back in his mouth. This is different than using an illustrator. I mean, this is... This is showing a story. We're really doing something to, to convey a story to the listener. Uh, I, I'd probably say it was truthful in isolation. Uh, seeing his baseline in the video you just saw and others that are, that are online, he doesn't do this. Hardly ever. There is a confirmation glance to the interviewer or camera right at the end, which is... If, if a confirmation glance, which is like I'm looking over here and I'm telling a story, and right when I wrap it up, you see something like this. And then I look back at you at the end. It's more likely to be deceptive or potentially deceptive if it's at the end, which it is here. That's all I got. <laughs> I thought you guys would think I was frozen. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Took me about five seconds to realize I was in that whale's mouth, and and I went, holy. Sh
I'm traveling through the water like fast. He, he's like cruising through the water and water's just pouring in through his mouth. And as soon as it happened, my regulator came out of my mouth and thank God the regulator didn't fall behind my back. It was like kind of pressed up between his mouth and me because it was kind of tight in there and I just saw my regulator there and I put it back in my mouth and went, okay, I got air, but I'm still in here. <laughs> Could you see anything? Could you feel anything like the whale's tongue? Um, you know, what was in your immediate surrounds? I just felt all hard muscles around me and and I could feel his like, I think it was his jaws kind of crushing my legs. And I'm, I'm trying to like move my legs so I could get into position to like swim out of his mouth. But none of that was working. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so, um, okay. So archetypally, what's really great about this, what's really compelling about it, one of the reasons we might go, oh, I really like this story, I wanna, I wanna believe it, is this idea of being, being crushed. He now can't move. There's now nothing he can do uh, about this. He tries to create a, a heroic, a slightly heroic idea. His story doesn't have a massive hero element of it, but there's a little bit here of going, oh, I'm trying to position myself to get in a place where I could battle my way out. But what he's playing now is the idea of there is now nothing that I can do. That's again, a classic archetype with these belly of whales stories is uh, you get trapped and there's nothing that you can do but wait. And that's the idea of, of human transformation. When you're going from, you know, the old version of you to the new version of you, you can't kind of har hurry it up. You just got to wait and see what, what happens and what develops. In the end, the whale will spit you out. You won't be able to fight the whale. So he's going along the right, the right lines, um, um, uh, archetypally uh again good physical storytelling which is great enter entertainment but so different from what we saw in that in that baseline um listen here's here's what i pick up from both this one and the last one if it were me and i know you know we can't judge everybody by ourselves one of the things we have to do is critically think and put ourselves in other situations but but if it were me um, and I'd been in that situation, I personally would have gone and researched now what the name of stuff is. And I did a little bit of research to go, well, I wonder what it is like inside a whale's mouth and what would you actually feel and what's the name of all the stuff there? Because it's, it's no mystery what the stuff is. There's very particular stuff in there. And so in the telling of the story, if it were true, um, what I'd want to be able to do and was to go, look, it was super dark and I, I couldn't see uh, anything and I was totally crushed and, and I could feel this hard stuff. And, and, and what that is, I've now learned is I would want to learn where had I been exactly? What exactly has happened to me? And, and what do other professionals who know this environment, because there's, there's people who like know the inside of a whale's mouth really well. Like I read, like there's no way you can get swallowed by a whale. There's no way because because biologists can't even get their, their arm down a, a whale's esophagus. I mean, it's a massive mouth because it's collecting up krill and sardines and whatever and filtering them out with these kind of bony things. And so you'd be able to say, say, well, the hard stuff, it was either the jawbone or it felt kind of rough. It was it was probably the filter system of, of, of the whale. And, and I now know that I wasn't going to get swallowed Swallowed because you can't get swallowed by a, by a whale. I know that stuff. And he doesn't seem interested in where he's actually been. I find that a little bit tricky to deal with. It's like, I got swallowed by a whale. No more investigation needed on, on that. No more detail. Don't need to, not even going to look at a little book on that. I mean, it's all over the internet, what the inside of a whale's mouth is like, but I'm not, not going to bother. <laughs> I'm a bit, I'm a bit intrigued uh, by that one. But look, that's just me. Maybe it's me. I, you know, I'm intrigued by stuff. I want to look at it, and maybe it's just, maybe it's just me. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right, again, this mine's going to be short because I, I'm not buying any of this. He starts off with talking about how 
he could feel the jaws crushing his legs, you know, and then he's talking about a plan. He's trying to plan to swim out. Pain is, well, well, focus your mind. It's a, it's, it's, it plays an important part when something like this is going on. It's a powerful motivator. And if something's crushing your legs, you're not going to try to be thinking about swimming out. You're going to be screaming again. Oh God, no, please. Oh God, no, please. No. That's where you're going with that at that point, because it hurts. If you think your legs are getting crushed, his weren't. The doctor said didn't have any even any soft tissue damage, but he says his knee hurt. That's what he said. <laughs> so this, I, I, I'm, I'm, that's all. I'm not going to, I got nothing at that point because I can't focus on it any more than that because it just sounds like, you know what, to me. So Chase, what do you got? I think everybody knows and I, I've learned this long ago in my childhood. If you're ever in there, you dig around, you find some wood between all the fish bones, and you start a fire. That's, <laughs> That's what you right. do. Everybody knows it. That's that old chestnut. Uh, so there's fabulous body narration here. He's a wonderful storyteller. Uh, he's a captivating storyteller. There's some lip licking at the beginning here with a no head shake. He's shaking the head no. His eyes move down here to internal dialogue. And there's some great body narration in here, but he's going, he's talking about I, I'm trying to move my legs. When he's saying I want to move my legs, there's some stress on the cleidomastoid muscles right here, which is associated with fear. And he's doing that while looking at the interviewer. And I think there's some, maybe some stress here around telling this part of the story. It's either stress from it really happening and him recalling the fear or stress, which we typically see uh, when people do a confirmation glance towards a questioner. Greg? Yeah, so a handful of things. Uh, number one, I see his respiration up. Number two, I see a tongue jet. Number three, I see him looking down left for internal conversation. Number four... His cadence has shifted. He is now dragging along, thinking of the details as he speaks. And I'm going to give you a really weird story. When I was 18, I wrestled a bear. Let me tell you, I don't have to think about the details about what that was like. It was one of the scariest damn things I ever did in my life. I thought it was a great idea, and then I got in there, and this thing was a bear. And that's all you need to know. But from there, if you ask me details, I can give them to you like that. It's not going to be, well, then it was like he was like a big, tall man in a suit. No, it's a bear. It was a whale. It was crunching me, and this was happening. You would remember those details. And you also would not lilt up at the end of each of those things. This guy's navigating story. He's making the details fit what he wants you to feel. He's not telling you that he wrestled a bear. He's not telling you he was swallowed by a whale. He's telling you a story. That's what I see. Hey, we good? Yeah, that is a true story, by the way. Was it? Was it? Was it <laughs> tell the story. Like tell the story, bear. Greg. Was it, Let's so, hear it. Like that, you could, you know, <laughs> hey, it was. A, it was a, money it was a, the bear. Yeah, yeah, I didn't pay. It was. I was eighteen, and this right. guy was traveling around. There was a wrestler who traveled around with a bear that people would wrestle, and all these celebrities yeah, yeah. would wrestle him. And yeah. I was, you know, I was like, I want to do it. And the guy goes, No, nah, this is for celebrities. So I walk up, and I, at the time, I had bushy red hair and the guy goes uh, the the local sportscaster walked up and said there's no way in hell i'm getting in there and walked off and he said hey red come up here and i went in and wrestled him and i thought okay he's a bear he watched on his back legs he's clumsy i'll grab his back legs and knock him down no i grabbed his back legs and he picked me up and slammed me on the ground <laughs> it started from there <laughs> And, he, you know, he weighed 600 pounds or so. And yeah. the guy would give him little signals to tell him to sit down on you and how much weight to put. And I kept getting out from under him because I was pretty, you know, pretty fast. And finally, the guy goes and the bear put all his weight on me. And I was like, oh, I give up. I give up. It was about that quick. About 30 wow. seconds. <laughs> wow. wow. That's great. I love the idea of like, I think I'll just take his legs from under him. Yeah. Like, He's a bear. Like, there have been 5 million years of bears <laughs> having doing that to bears. It's like, yeah. and by yeah. now the bear has learned, yeah, no way. He was getting was all tactical on him. <laughs> it was grabbing two trees, you know, they just kind of stopped when yeah. you hit them. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> 
could you see anything? Could you feel anything like the whale's tongue? Um, you know, what was in your immediate surrounds? I just felt all hard muscles around me and and I could feel his like, I think it was his jaws kind of crushing my legs and I'm, I'm trying to like move my legs so I could get into position to like swim out of his mouth. But none of that was working. For you, it's life or death. At this point, you think you're going to die. I was convinced, you know, I, I was convinced. And, and I'm getting shivers right now. Um, yeah, I was convinced. I, I, was, I was dead and, and all I could think about was my boys and I have a lovely wife and a mother that has gone through hell. Yeah, I was, I was convinced, okay. This is how you're gonna go, Michael. This sucks. <laughs> this, this sucks. <laughs> Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so, um, so first of all, he has to tell us the feeling, okay? He has to signal to us verbally, or oh, I'm getting goosebumps. Uh, what, what usually would happen is you just get goosebumps and the emotion just hits you. You don't usually, tell somebody beforehand, hey, here's what's on its way, here's what's coming. So that's that's a little bit of an issue to me. Then there's this kind of um, <coughs> double cough that comes for, for no reason. You know, that for me is a very large version of the vocal click where there's, there's something has to go on uh, which doesn't need to go on. There's no need for him to clear his throat. Uh, he's not expended enough emotional energy or, or delivered enough words to really need have a, anything of a buildup, I, I would suggest. So it, it's really about trying to fill time and, and distract, I think, that, 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 uh, that coughing there. Um, what's interesting, again, in terms of a of a story is it's heading along the right lines for us to be a compelling story because there's this moment of of realization that uh of of his of of his real role which is that of parent husband and son of somebody else who's been to to hell as well that's really interesting because if you look at all the heroes the heroes are all always born of somebody who did something of the same journey as well so they, so it's beautifully archetypal and, and and this comes from just this is just a cultural behavior we get we get these stories all the time uh, you only need to watch all of the marvel films and they are they are as old as the as the hills there's plenty of bellies of the whale uh, in all of those Marvel films, uh, for example. So he's picking up on these culturally, and then some would say it's actually embedded even deeper in a, in a kind of a universal uh, genetic code, which, which, which may have some uh, validity to it as well. But essentially, we pass, culture can do the work without DNA. We pass down stories um, uh, over time. Uh, so he's he's now we've now got to the point in the story where his his he's been disrobed his profession is no longer his persona and he's realised his new persona which is that of the parent the husband and the son so the story is going quite beautifully uh, at at this point and uh, and he tried to bring us some emotion that had to signal it to us uh, that's not that's not so good a performance. Chase, what do you got for us? Mark, I think you could look at a Starbucks menu and find some kind of Disney or story structure uh, element to it. But, but, I, I, can, I, I can it. actually look at a Starbucks cup and do it, but okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could too. Yeah. That's expertise. Very it's, good reason why yeah, Starbucks expertise. is called Starbucks, and it's to do with whales. So right down below what the, what the connection is between Starbucks and whales. Anyway, thanks for that, Chase. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the reporter 
shifts to a present tense provocative statement. If you'll notice, the reporter's not asking a question. He's using a provocative statement, but he's present tensing the person that he's asking here. And we see that the response, he is selling emotion. He conveys the shivers before the emotional part of the story to show you I'm getting emotional here. But just to tell you, like, here's some evidence for it. I'm going to give you a little bit of evidence just so you know, so you know it's the real deal. And, I'll, and it looks as though he's holding back emotion here. He's holding back uh, some agony. And the shivers were discussed to ensure you had more data to verify in case that didn't sell it all the way. And I, he's repeating uh, convinced is is more deceptive than repeating the thoughts that he's had, like, I'm going to die. Holy crap. Oh, my God. Not I was convinced. He, he did not have that thought in there. Well, if he did, that may, might be the first human to do that. I am convinced that I'm going to die. Uh, I'm going to die is more compelling and more truthful. When we say I'm convinced, we're trying to convince another person. I think it's interesting that he said, all I could think of was my boys and I have a lovely wife, which is present tense and separated. A little bit different. Uh, his, his dramatization had some lip licking in there. And there's a, there's a completion glance like, okay, I'm done with the story now. And the reporter didn't keep going. He let it hang. And those are the moments when we can see whether or not, Scott, I'll let you talk about it. Those are great moments. Uh, Scott, what do you got? Okay. Yeah, this isn't going to take long for me at all again. I think that face he's making, he's trying to conjure up that emotion he had when he when he was talking about dying from the airplane crash, but he couldn't do it. He couldn't get it. He couldn't get it to happen. So that's why he makes that odd face. But I agree with you, Chase. There's all that stuff going on. He's running all those all those scenarios that that you're talking about. That's going on right there. But he tries to look like he's crying. He can't pull it off because because obviously it's not true to me anyway. It's obvious it's not true. Um, then. Uh, then he, then he goes into the classic, what I'll call the Hartley Chaff and Drag, redirect, which is he just starts talking about other stuff after that. You talk, so you thought you were going to die? Yeah, I thought I was going to die. And then he d d does that little then from there, yeah, then he goes on to talk about his kids and his wife, and then he leaves them hanging right there, and he doesn't know what else to say. So he just keeps going, in other words, you know, you know, like that. Repeat. That's yeah, just that repetition is just, uh, it's, it's, it's so painful to watch. Oh, God. Anyway, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, same thing. The fake cry. If you've already cried in front of a camera, you should probably not try it again unless you're ready for it and be ready. You know, it's not like we don't have something to compare it to. Now, of course, he's probably not thinking, hey, somebody's going to watch something from 20 years ago and compare me, but we are. He breaks eye contact away and looks down to the left when he can't conjure the emotion. If you're going to fake cry, at least go to an emotional space and try to remember something. Maybe he is trying to remember that. Uh, but that is a great use of let him talk. It's among my favorite. You see that little whimper in the head shake. And then he goes into a filibuster is probably a good word for it. He just kind of has to say something and he's just puking words. And there's no real value to him. You guys got everything else. That's just all I have. He's not adding credibility to the story with whimpering kind of cry we didn't see any chin boss that's that yeah and we might say at the end he is blubbering <laughs> no all right i quit <laughs> <laughs> for you it's life or death at this point you think you're going to die i was convinced you know i i was convinced and and I'm getting shivers right now. Um, yeah, I was convinced. I, I was I was dead, and, and all I could think about was my boys, and I have a lovely wife, and a mother that has gone through hell. Yeah, I was I was convinced. Okay, this is how you're gonna go, Michael. This sucks. <laughs> 
Es, es sucks. <lacht> His frightening fear was that the humpback would panic and then dive, taking him to a deep and slow death. Okay, I'm in here. I just dove down. I have a full tank of air. Am I going to be in this whale's mouth for the next 50 minutes until I run out of air? Because it... I could tell that he wasn't going to kill me, me, me being in his mouth. It's just, I'm stuck in his mouth. And then I felt him going up, and I saw light, and then he started getting really erratic and really, like, shaking and, and getting aggressive. And I was like, oh, my God, he doesn't like this. He, he's trying to get rid of me. I had just a tiny bit of hope, and then he's thrashing and going back and forth, and all of a sudden, light... Chase, what do you got? If you just look at a dive table, uh, which we were just talking about, he would have something called barotrauma. Or, and this is where we get injured from going to high pressure to low pressure pretty quickly. This is where the nitrogen bubbles and the tiny little bubbles in your whole body shrink down and then get big really fast. And that causes a big problem. And... He says he's already near the bottom and he's diving in his scuba gear near the bottom. I'm not sure how he could be worried about diving to the depths. And that's going to be one of his big fears, unless maybe there's some big cliff or some scary hole right there where these whales like to hang out in. But I'm not sure. So when, we, when we're watching this, he uses present tense three times. We see him say, and I'm in here, and he says here, not there. It's very important if you're ever listening to somebody and they're telling a past tense story and they use here language as if they're in that location. So it's not just present tense. It's geographically changed to that location. Then he says, I just dived down. I have a full tank of air. And then there's some lip licking going on which we talked about already. And then there's a shift to past tense. There is a genuine smile when he's talk, when he's saying he's trying to get rid of me. I think there's some actual elation on the, on the face there, but he uses and then three times and he uses the word and nine times in this tiny little clip, which Greg would call hiding time. I think that's a perfect uh, thing. I've already stolen it in some of my trainings and, and reused it. Uh, Scott, what do you got? <laughs> All right. Um, this wouldn't be the process you'd use to describe what was happening. You just And you just said all that, Chase. That's part of what you're saying in a nutshell there. And like you said before, he's already at or near the bottom. So well, where is this thing going? It's not going anywhere because he's not in it. I'll tell you where I think he is in a minute. Do you guys do you guys know where you think he is already? Or what happens? We'll talk about that at the end. Um, and then he talks about moving. He's talking about moving the whole time. So since he got in this thing, supposedly, all he talks about is this movement he, that, that's going on. He's moving, moving, and finally goes up, and the whale starts getting violent, trying to shake him out. That's not the way whales get rid of stuff in their mouth at all, not even a little bit. They don't shake their head. You don't shake your head. It doesn't have a head. It just shakes the whole, the thing would go back and forth like that. It just turns its mouth and throws you out. It's not tough at all. Like Mark, I got on there and looked around too. I saw that video on what happens if you get swallowed by a whale for real. You go through like four stomachs, like my old English teacher had. I should take that out. Um, going to come get you. Yeah, yeah, I shouldn't have said that. Anyway. Uh, this is not how you tell the story. I don't think that I, I I I don't think this happened. I can't again. I can't go any further than this. It's just on my last nerve. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So I can really help help try to make the story better. I mean, just an, an even better myth because he is what he is trying to do here is touch the mythological, and there's nothing wrong with that. As as Greg has said, now you know you, you can't let facts get in the way of a great story. So it needs embellishing even further, which actually means he does need to go down deeper. It does need to get worse. And what a 
great opportunity, uh, as Chase was saying, to get the bends, therefore to get, you know, the wrong amount of nitrogen bubbles in your blood and start to go into a, another worldly experience where you would lose time. And therefore you could say, I just don't know what was happening in time at that point. And I kept going deeper and deeper and deeper. And now we're into much better archetypal storytelling. But where this goes is, is straight to the new metaphor, which is up into the light, which again is a, is a, is a, is a classic. Um, the payoff has started to come in this story. He's up towards the light. He now starts signaling towards the moment of chaos which is like the final battle. It's like, you know, in Lord of the Rings where there's just a final, you know, massive nutty battle that goes on or, or any, or any uh, Marvel movie at the moment where, where it's just this chaotic bunch of incredible action just goes on. That's what he's trying to signal at there of total chaos. And at the end of it, you get a moment of, of, of rebirth. You come out a, a, a different person. And there he is floating on top of the water, looking at the sky, looking at the ethereal, uh, an, a new person. That's what he's, what he's hinting towards. In this story, it happens a little bit, a little bit quick. Uh, you know, maybe this story will, will embellish over, over time. And as it's told to somebody and told to somebody else, uh, maybe you'll go and tell this story and, and embellish it a little bit more. And it'll be even more compelling than it is. It's not a bad story. It's a great, it's a great story as to how accurate it is. There's probably some element. I mean, yeah, he's a diver. He dives for lobsters. It's like, that's, that's happening. He's probably been near some whales. He maybe had a brush with a whale. One got really, really close maybe that day maybe another day i i i, I don't know um but on this particular day yeah, not sure not sure about that uh who have we got left uh greg yeah 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 so um, you covered almost everything what i would say is this i'm a diver i'm going to give you times and a full tank of air will give me 51 minutes or 54 minutes i forget what he said and you know what he's using is some facts to lend credibility to his story not important to the story I mean, who cares if you got 54 minutes in a whale's mouth because if you're really a diver you know that if he goes 300 feet down first of all your air is not going to last as long at that depth and you also know that you're going to burn up a lot of air if you're in a whale's mouth it's not going to be 54 minutes it's going to be some derivative thereof so he's using some facts that he has that you the public may not have that's too much information to me. If I'm thinking about what I'm doing inside this whale's mouth, I'm thinking I'm trying to get out, I'm poking, I'm gouging, I'm grabbing its back, I'm doing whatever it takes to get away. I'm going to do what, I'm gonna tell you how, everything I did. Just a weird, too much information kind of storytelling. His accessing, and it's just storytelling is what it feels like. If Does it mean that he didn't get swallowed by a whale? No, you could still get swallowed by a whale and come up and make up a bunch of stories and make the story better, get grabbed by a whale. And there are people who've been grabbed by whales and have visual evidence of it, pictures of it. I don't think that's the case here. That's it. His frightening fear was that the humpback would panic and then dive, taking him to a deep and slow death. Okay, I'm in here. I just dove down. I have a full tank of air. Am I going to be in this whale's mouth for the next 50 minutes until I run out of air? Because it, I could tell that he wasn't going to kill me, me, me being in his mouth. It's just, I'm stuck in his mouth. And then I felt him going up and I saw light. And then he started getting really erratic and really like shaking and, and getting aggressive. And I was like, oh my God, he doesn't like this. He, he's trying to get rid of me. I had just a tiny bit of hope, and then he's thrashing and going back and forth, and all of a sudden, light. Okay. I just was laying on the surface of the water looking up, and I was like, oh, my God. I got out of it. <laughs> I got out of it. I'm alive, no matter how injured I am. I'm not going to die. I'm here. I could have broken legs. I could have a broken back, but I'm not dead. And I'm not going to die in a whale's mouth. That was your first thought? Or what was the first word that popped truly into your mind when you got spat out? I can't believe I escaped that. 
All right. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Wonderful body narration again. And it's truthful sounding tone shifting where the tone is up and down. It sounds like maybe a truthful story. If you didn't know the baseline, I might, I might dig it. There's more lip licking. So we're seeing that it's a baseline for a certain type of behavior here. But there's something before he's continuing with the I got out of it. There's what's called an attention check. So he's making sure that there's some attention there before he gets to this part of the story. But he makes one big mistake that I see all too often with a lot of the people who eventually wind up being guilty. And that is he breaks eye contact at the critical moment of the story. He looks away as if there's a need to access something. And my phone's going off, sorry. There's some expression modification there. You see his facial expression change and get modified when he says, I'm not going to die. And then in a whale's mouth is an afterthought. And right after that, I think he regrets just throwing that on top of it. There's lip compression. There's a tongue jut. There's eye flutter. You guys can talk about that. There's more eye flutter at the second question. And he says, escaped that. Not from that, not escaped that whale, not the whale spat me out. He escaped from something or he got out of something or got untangled from something here. And I'll pass it to you, Greg. Yeah, different eye accessing cue this time. Look, changed entirely where he went in the hemisphere of his head. I mean, we all say patterns matter. And we've seen what he does. He looks left. He looks left. He looks left. Now he's looking right. Suddenly he's changing something. He's still got the storytelling down. His blink rate goes through the roof and then he eye locks and does that mouth grooming thing. All those are indicators that we didn't see when he was telling a story about a plane crash. Didn't see him then. Probably shouldn't see him now if he's telling the same story. Scott? Yeah, I, I think what happened here was he, he makes it so uncomfortable for you to go against what he's saying with that whole laughing wonderfully I'm going to live thing. It's, it's just like a child. He's talking like a little kid telling a story. And having said that, one time my, my sister's son, Jay, was he was nine years old. And I was coming through the kitchen and I was saying, hey, what's going on, man? He said, did you know I'm the, the um, one of those guns that are, uh, that are they're plastic, but they look real. Um, Airsoft. Airsoft, he said. Did you know I'm the airsoft champion of Nashville of uh, Knoxville? I said no, I didn't know that. Man, you're the airsoft champion. He said, Yeah, man, we have we have you know contests all the time, and I'm I'm the number one guy in the whole in all Knoxville. I was like, You're kidding me? I was buying. It. You're kidding me? He's like, No. I'm, and my brother was coming through the kitchen. I said, Hey, Mitch, come here. Do you know Jay is like the he's the number one airsoft guy in Knoxville? And he goes, No, he isn't. And I said, Well, you tell him. He was oh, he was selling it, man. I was buying the whole thing. But it was his delivery of it. It just looked so so real and just sell it to me. And I was like, Yeah, okay. So I can get taken by these. But this one is worse than than his story, than Jay's story. This is and this is a nine year old, and this guy is like in his fifties at least, and he's telling this. High age probably, I, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think what he's doing is telling, is making it so uncomfortable for this guy to go against him that you can't say, wait a minute, are you kidding? You, you know, hold on a second, back up a little bit. You can't do that because like, oh, it's it's over now. It's not. He's got a couple more things to say. That's that's what I think. I just, I just, I'm trying to get into this. I just, it's tough, man. It's tough. I just, it just irks me, the, you know what, out of me. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, well, for a start, what I've got is it's much more fun to hang out with the, you know, airsoft champion of, of Knoxville than not. And that's why yeah. we buy these. It's just much more fun. Like, right? <laughs> you know, this is my friend. He's the air gun champion. Or this is my friend. He's totally average, but possibly below average, <laughs> you know. So that's that's why, you know, it's important to accept a lie uh, or, a, or a grand story because it makes life much more fun so you know around that we we don't want to be too harsh on this on this guy because he is coming up with with you know he's getting towards a quite a good story 
here. Um, I think what's happening here, so this is where we hear the repetition of, of exactly what we heard in the first uh, story here. Um, I'm alive. Um, uh, my, uh, oh my God, oh my God, I'm alive. It's, it's, I think, almost a direct quote from his uh, last one, which is a real trauma. Here's what I believe, and this is a bit of like, you know, the doctor is in, but, but I think it is the projection of that trauma onto a new story. I think that's simply what's, what's happening here. It's a way to, to enjoy and live through and express some of that old trauma, which would be super traumatic. You crash, it's the worst thing ever. You crash in a plane and you're in the middle of a jungle. It's like there's nothing good about that. There's no upside, I think, to, to any of that. And the trauma that somebody must go through. And then, of course, yeah, to then put that trauma somewhere else in an even potentially a, a grander narrative that you actually have a little bit of control of as well. I mean, there's some there's some benefits to that, and bring that story to a, a bigger audience. There's some benefits to that as well, which we can talk about a little bit later. But I think that's what's happening here. It's the retelling of that crash story uh, in a in an in another land, yeah. uh, essentially, um, which there's something you know quite important about about that uh, for sure. The idea of um, you can't escape those moments essentially in both in both of those stories you can't escape those moments you have to let them pass it's like anything that grabs hold of you and and strips you of everything that you already knew because it's so traumatic you can't fight your way out of it you have to just let it pass and find out who you are and what you're left with you know after that it's an important it's an important uh, lesson uh, for people. Uh, so that's all I got on, on that one. I just was laying on the surface of the water looking up. And I was like, oh my God, I got out of it. <laughs> I got out of it. I'm alive. No matter how injured I am, I'm not going to die. I'm here. I could have broken legs, I could have a broken back, but I'm not dead and I'm not going to die in a whale's mouth. That was your first thought or what was the first word that popped truly into your mind when you got spat out? I can't believe I escaped that. That's too bad. There are definitely people out there who would say... This is just all made up. There's been some of that here. At first, it didn't really bother me, but then it started to bother me, and I kind of talked to friends of mine, and friends were reaching out to me and, 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 and just telling, don't worry about them, Michael. We know you. We've known you your whole life. Michael Packer's the last person to make up something like this. If anything, I downplay stuff. It's like, you know, I go out and gale force winds and, you know, catch giant tuna by myself and then I'll come in and how was the weather? Ah, it wasn't bad. And so the reinforcement that I got from the community really just made me not worry about what anybody else had to say. All right, Greg, what do you got? I'm, I'm just gonna hit a few things. I'll leave plenty for you guys. He's talking about himself in third person, number one. Does resume statements about being He-Man. Um, there's a little duper's delight actually going on. One shoulder rises, and he does a sour taste thing. Guys, you watched us enough. You know all of the – any of those individually, you're probably like, oh, yeah, yeah, so what? He did raised a shoulder. Oh, a little duper's delight maybe, or at least a little smile, whether it's duper's or not. Talk about yourself in third person and then telling everybody, you know, I'm made out of iron and – all that together makes you start to go, yeah, maybe not. Maybe that's not what it appears to be. Chase, I'll let you take it from there. I think this is a great opportunity for a baseline check because it does bother him. So we are <laughs> seeing some stuff here that actually does bother him. Uh, there's no eye flutter. And it started to bother him. Some friends called. And when he said friends called, there's some auditory recall. There's He's looking to the side for the first time in a long time, if I haven't seen it yet. And so I think that's truthful. 
And when he says, I'm the last person to make up something, we see some glabella, which is these two little lines here, which typically means uh, disagreement and that muscle flexes there. And we see a very rapid eye flutter or eye blocking uh, behavior here, which is indicative of high levels of stress. But I want you to pay attention for this, because if you're interviewing a babysitter for your kids, you're interviewing somebody that's going to work for your company, this is a big deal. When he talks about the community, you will see contempt on his face. And you can see it right there with the left side of his mouth. Go go right up when he talks about the community. That's all I got. Uh, Mark? Yeah, I mean, you, you've picked through, I think, just about everything there. Uh, yeah, I saw the, the sour taste, the contempt, uh, the resume statement, um, you know, the use of third person, um, the last person. Um, I'll just add one more thing to it, which is something like this. Okay, so you could you could make up this then, but you'd be the last person to make up something like this. But this is a possibility. So look, a good answer, a good answer uh, to, to, you know, look, there's people in the community who say you're making this up. You just go, well, they're wrong. This is true. Yeah, you wouldn't say this is absolutely true. You might, that might be, unless absolutely was your baseline. And you wouldn't go, well, you know, Mark Bowden is the last person to make up anything like this. <laughs> At the moment, if I'd said that to you guys, well, Mark Bowden is the last person to make up anything like this. <laughs> You'd just go, yeah, you're making some stuff up, aren't you, Mark? And I go, yeah, I'm totally making Chase Hughes agrees up. with you. <laughs> Chase Hughes. Greg Hartley, too. Yeah. Chase Hughes would. would be the first person to call me out in that, in that kind of situation, I think. So yeah, and and yeah, I, I agree with you, Chase. There's there's some there's some elements of disgust there around and 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 contempt around who's calling him out on this. You know, I think I think he'd like a, a better pass on this on this story. I think he'd like to, it to be accepted a little bit more. No problem with that. Like it's a really good, like it's an epic story. Like it's a super epic I, I, idea, um, which which usually only gets told in films. And so it's a, it's a great opportunity for, you know, somebody to go, look, first person story, I was there, I actually did this, it's actually happened to me. It's a great opportunity for a story like that. Uh, Scott, what do you got for us? Here's what Scott Rouse sees. <laughs> Scott Rouse <laughs> understands that um, he's ready for this question. I think he's ready for it. Because when he says, there are people out there, you see those lips go into a short little pursing thing which denotes, indicates disagreement with what's, what's happening. So I think he's ready for this one. And then he says, at first it really didn't bother me. That's when we see the contempt two times. Now, what he should have had there was contempt first and then disgust, because that should disgust him that people in his community, those people would, would think that about him. That's what I, that's, that's the way I feel about it. I'd be disgusted with that. That would, so I think it, we're missing that. We're missing an expression there. We see it two times. And uh, then back to Chaff and Redirect, the Hartley Chaff and Redirect. Um, and it says, I'm a badass resume. Telling about how he goes out and catches tuna and does all this stuff. And the weather's not bad. It's Giant horrible. Giant tuna. Giant that's, tuna. That's true. Yeah. Russell yeah, yeah, Scott. Scott. Just a tuna. Yeah, Scott missed <laughs> that one. But, uh, yeah, so he starts telling about what a cool guy he is. How it's hurricane-type weather, but, nah, it doesn't bother him, man. He can come on in. He, the weather's fine out there. It's not bad at all. Yeah, it's, that's, so that's what we're seeing is uh, his resume statement there. It's just, it's just, it just continues this ugh, of, I can't, we can't cuss on here, but it's, it's just bad. Just, just same old, same old. Okay, we good? There are definitely people out there who would say, this is just all made up. There's been some of that here. At first, it didn't really bother me, but then it started to bother me, and I kind of talked to friends of mine, and friends were reaching out to me and, 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 and just telling, don't worry about them, Michael. We know you. We've known you your whole life. Michael Packer's the last person to make up something like this. If anything, I downplay stuff. It's like, you know, I go out and gale force winds and, you know, catch giant tuna by myself and then I'll come in and how is the weather? 
eh, it wasn't bad. And so the reinforcement that I got from the community really just made me not worry about what anybody else had to say. Yeah, good. Yeah. My boat is good. I haven't watched it at all. So. <laughs> so what would you say to all those people around the world who might doubt your story then? I, I don't know. Come and meet me. Shake my hand. If, if it worries you that much or, you know. Diving's my life. Fishing's my life. I mean, I, I, here I haven't, I haven't fished in two weeks now and, and I'm going out of my mind. Physically, I'm pretty good besides my knee and I, I plan on getting in the water next week. You're joking. No, my wife's not happy about it. <laughs> I'll go first. I'll go first. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Chaff and redirect. I'm done. I'm out. Chase, what do you got? <laughs> we need to start putting more than one of those on the bingo card. <laughs> yeah. Just one isn't enough. So there's an immediate rise in vocal pitch here, which is indicative of stress. There's a shoulder shrug. Both of them go up, which is we tend to do this as an apology. If we're sorry about something, we don't feel good about something. Our shoulders go up and we, we could dig into that all day. But we see his body physically shrinking and we see lip retraction, which is more of the body getting smaller. And anytime a, a pencil, a tip of a pen, a, a woman putting her hair in her mouth, a finger is typically a need for reassurance. And then after lip retraction, we see lip licking and there's more sternocleidomastoid muscle at a uh, plan on getting in the water next week. We see this ooh, fear response when he's talking <laughs> about that, uh, mostly because maybe it's because of his wife. But it, please keep in mind, no matter what we think about this video, this could have happened. This could have happened. And, and keep in mind, what you're seeing here is like 8% of our skill set when, when the rest of it, the other 92%, is in questioning techniques and how we're moving our behavior and when we smile and when we lean back and forward during this interview and, and what we ask and what we don't ask. So obviously we can't be definitive here. So uh, we can make assumptions. Absolutely. Which is what you're here for. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, Scott, I'll give it to you. Okay. <laughs> Here's what Scott thinks. Um, this, uh, yeah, Greg, you're right. It's, it's all chaff and redirect. And he's trying to, and just like when somebody's stealing stuff, something from a store, they get ready to do something. They start making themselves smaller. This guy's right in the middle of it. And he, and, and this is, he's pinpointed down to, are you telling the truth or not? You know, what do you think about that? And he's saying, I don't know. I, I don't know. Like a kid. This, he goes back to being a child again. This, this is so far removed from his, from the baseline we saw in the other video, which we're going to see in a second ridiculous this this is and, and i agree with you chase it could have happened but it didn't happen <laughs> this didn't happen i mean everything i've got i would bet that little dog i mean hattie i'd bet everything on 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 that it didn't happen i'll tell you what i think happened in a minute mark what do you got oh you did you already go you didn't go no 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 okay. Not been, okay. yeah uh okay um so so i think the best i can do here is is help make it a better story okay so here's what would happen in a, in a better story, because essentially the story he's telling is the journey and return, where somebody journeys out into the abyss, they, they are defrocked of their, their profession, everything that gave them status, and they come out knowing who they truly are. And that's the real gold, not the lobster. The real gold is who they come back as, and that knowledge that they, they then bring back to the town, the village, the family. But the unfortunate thing is, is when you bring back that new knowledge, you don't really fit in anymore. So for example, Bilbo and, you know, can't stay in the, in the town uh, anymore. It just doesn't fit in anymore. So here's what happens in this guy's uh, archetypal belly of a whale story. He starts in a fisherman and he ends a fisherman. It's like nothing changes. And that's the problem with this as a really good grand narrative. This is where he need, now needs to move this story is uh, he can't go, hey, I'm just getting back in the water next week. I'm, I, I love fishing. He needs to come back 
somebody completely different, utterly changed uh, by this. And, and so that's why this story, I don't think, is as, it doesn't leave us as satiated as it kind of projects that it should uh, at the start. I think that's partly why we got this interviewer there who's really trying to boost this thing up because I think the, the channel know this doesn't really pay off as well as it could and it needs the story needs a bit of a rework like if this was hollywood we'd have a whole bunch of writers who really know how to write this stuff who go no 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 you don't know you know sorry you 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 leave your wife at the end of this you just don't fit in anymore yeah it's just i mean it's, it's tragic that element but you know what you do is you give them the gift of the knowledge that came from being in the belly of a whale anyway so it's a bit unsatisfying as a as a as a great story uh in the end um, uh, you know, the only last thing I would say is like, why, you know, why are we interested in these in these stories, whether it's I got bitten by a dog or wrestled a bear or 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 got, you know, eaten by a by a whale? Well, great stories. And I, and I hope you're getting this from all of these stories that you see on our on our channel and that you that you watch is that great stories. Um, they they. Well, they don't make you any less afraid. They make you braver. So none of these stories are meant to make you go, hey, I shouldn't fear a whale uh, at all. No, it, it's meant to go, well, I should get back in the water. I should get in the water because I've been forearmed with a little bit of knowledge around this. And unfortunately, he doesn't really come back with the knowledge around how to manage these kind of situations. It really is for me just a projection of, or a, a sublimation of the trauma that he went uh, through. Uh, I'd love to see it turned into a Hollywood film. Uh, be, really, be really, you know, with more writers, be really fantastic, uh, I think. A few more characters, okay. subplots. So what would you say to all those people around the world who might doubt your story then? I, I don't know. Come and meet me. Shake my hand. If, if it worries you that much or, you know. Diving's my life, fishing's my life. I mean, I, I, here I haven't, I haven't fished in two weeks now and, and I'm going out of my mind. Physically, I'm pretty good besides my knee and I, I plan on getting in the water next week. You're joking. No, my wife's not happy about it. <laughs> Now let's go around and let's tell what we think happened in this thing, really. We'll just go, I'll go first, Mark, Chase, then Greg. So here's what I think happened. I think because I watched, the, I watched the whole interview of this, and his friend who was on the boat that he was on said he saw him come flying out of the water, his feet were up in the air, and he left the water. He never says this. I think what happened is, I think the whale just hit him with his tail. And knocked him up out of the water. And then he came up with this. By the time he swam back to the boat, all freaked out. He came up with the story. said, yeah, man, I got swallowed by a whale. That's what I think happened. I think he's a good storyteller because he's been telling stories since he was a little kid. I think he's full of it. And he's good at being at, at telling stories like that because he is full of it. So that's what I think happened. I think he got hit by the whale. That happened. But I don't think any other stuff happened. I don't think any of it happened except for getting hit by the whale. Mark? Yeah, I think the same. I think it was probably a, a, a shocking brush with a flipping great fish and uh, not a fish, mammal, obviously. You know that. I know that. Uh, but, but uh, you know, a, a shocking brush. And, and during that process, uh, that other life and death story came up in his mind and he projected that onto this and he, and he started telling that and then he can't go back on it. And actually, it's, it's a lot of fun. I mean, he's already <clears> been on television once doing this kind of thing. Um, it can be quite fun being on, on TV. And so he, he quite enjoys that. And I think his end thing is they're like, I've done a couple of weeks of this, so I'm going to go back to being a fisherman. Now, once a fisherman, always a fisherman. <laughs> so I think that's what happened. Uh, Chase, what do you think? I totally agree with you guys. This, this reminds me of a Seinfeld episode where George Costanza removes a golf ball from the blowhole of a whale that's beached. And this really uh, pretty girl that he likes sees him do it. So he pretends to be a marine biologist. And at that point, 
he can't go back. He's got to continue to invent new stuff, and it has to do with a whale. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I agree with you all. And Greg? Yeah, the guy's got a remarkable life story. I lived through a yeah. plane crash in Costa yeah. Rica in the jungle. That's a that's a pretty amazing story. And we heard him tell that story, and we could see he's a storyteller. I think something happened. I don't know. Did he get grabbed, taken down a little bit, and punch out, and come flying out? Did he get in a, Who knows? I think there's some encounter with that whale that day, and I think he's embellished. That's one of the ways we deceive people is by making the fish this big. That's what I see. All right. Well, if you like what we're doing, please subscribe and hit the like button. And uh, I think that was good, fellas. Yeah. And, uh, Fun one, for sure. I'll, yeah. And I'll see you next time. See you now. I don't know why I said, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know.